have a Bible today, if you have a Bible somewhere in your house or in your home, that is the most important item that you can own. In fact, I will say this, the most powerful item you can own. There's nothing like God's Word. And uh, so many folks who have never read it, have never tried it, have never put it to use, don't know its power. And today I want to just help you with a lesson this morning. We're in the month of May and we're going to start a new series of sermons called Finding Purpose in Every Season. In every season. Now, our weather outside is not really figuring out which season it's in, okay? Is it uh, winter? Is it spring? Is it summer? It's different every day at this juncture. But I really want to help you today. I want you to get one truth. I've been really praying for this message for many, many weeks, and I hope it'll be a help to you. If you have a copy of God's Word there or in the pew in front of you, you can grab one. I really will encourage you to open your Bibles to Ecclesiastes chapter number 3. Ecclesiastes is probably right in the middle of your Bible, I guess. It's going to be somewhere close to it. Psalms, Proverbs, Ecclesiastes. Ecclesiastes chapter 3. Ecclesiastes is one of, it's kind of a misunderstood book of the Bible. We did a whole sermon series on Wednesday nights not too long ago on it. There's great wisdom in Ecclesiastes. To some people, they think it's like a negative book. There's some good points in it. But I want you to look at chapter 3. Let's all stand together as we honor the reading of God's word. If you don't have a scripture, I think we gave you the notes this morning. It should have been in your bulletin. Hopefully you have those notes in front of you as well. So you can follow along in the notes if you don't have your Bibles. Let's follow along there. I'll ask you to read verse number 1 with me and verse number 11 with me. Let's read together verse number 1, shall we? To everything there is a season, and a time to every purpose under heaven. A time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted. A time to kill and a time to heal. A time to break down and a time to build up. A time to weep, a time to laugh. A time to mourn and a time to dance. A time to cast away stones, a time to gather stones together. A time to embrace and a time to refrain from embracing, a time to get, and a time to lose, a time to keep, a time to cast away, a time to rend, and a time to sow, a time to keep silence, and a time to speak, a time to love, and a time to hate, a time of war, and a time of peace. What profit hath he that worketh in that wherein he laboreth? I have seen the travail which God hath given to the sons of men to be exercised in it. Would you read with me verse 11 together, shall we? He hath made everything beautiful in his time. Also he hath set the world in their heart so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. And Lord, we just come this morning and I know, Lord, I speak For myself and also on behalf of these, we are needy people. We have many needs. And although, Lord, we may try to mask it, Lord, I know that each and every heart that I speak to this morning is going through a season, maybe a difficult season, maybe a trying season, a difficult season, I pray, that, Lord, you'd help your word give us, first of all, an understanding of our season. Help us, Lord, to see you at work in our season. And I pray you'd make yourself known, make yourself powerful, make yourself evident through your word this morning. Holy Spirit, I ask that you, you do not let me speak my opinion. Help me to speak your word this morning. That's what we need. And is it, it is in these things that we pray, Lord Jesus. Amen. Go and be seated this morning. How many of you have a favorite season? Anybody have a favorite season? All right. How many of you, how many of you spring is your favorite season? I want to see some hands this morning. We got a couple people. Spring is your favorite season. How many of you, how many of you, summer, summer is your favorite season, okay? All right, some of you still have that little kid that went to school in your heart, don't you? Summer, that's the best, isn't it? How many of you love fall? Autumn is your favorite season, that's me. How many of you, winter is your favorite season? There's a couple winters, okay. There's a couple reprobates in the, in the room this morning, I'm just kidding on that one. Actually, to be honest with you, I love fall. Fall's my favorite season. I mean, there's just something about the fall weather. There's something about the crispness in the air. The beauty, I think, is 
best bar none. Only the best people are born in the fall season. Can I get an amen on that one? Okay, that was a little weak fall, people. All right, giving you an opportunity there. We have, I mean, football's in the fall. I mean, there's so many good blessings God has. Fall's the best season. And, uh, I mean, there's maybe a season that we wait for, sometimes all year round. But I'm just here to tell you, though, whether you enjoy the season that we're in, we're in spring, I guess. If you, whether you enjoy, spring is my least favorite season, actually. I'm not a fan of spring that much, okay? Whether you enjoy the season or whether you don't like the season, how many of you realize the seasons come around every year, every so often? It wouldn't be too great if my favorite season, fall, happened continually. We'd, we'd have some problems, would we not? We'd have some issues because there are some seasons that are there for a purpose. I want you to notice in our text this morning, we find in life that there are seasons, and it's mentioned here, the Bible uses seasons. In fact, if you notice, times and seasons are mentioned continually in Scripture. You'll see wide swings. In fact, Solomon, the writer of our book, the Bible called him the wisest man who ever lived. God gave him incredible wisdom. As he writes this from a perspective of an older man, we see some extremes in life. Do you see them? A time to be born and a time to die. We see some extremes and some seasons of life. I want you to realize that in these stories, in these lessons, in these extremes, I want you to notice everybody's life is always changing. It's one of the things you can come to expect in life, is that it's always going to change. There is one who never changes, however. Do you know we have a God, the Bible says, who never changes. He is God. He never changes. By the way, Jesus Christ, the Bible says, is the same yesterday and today and forever. We have a God who does not change, even though everything we see around us is constantly at, at, at change. Seasons are always changing. But today I want to ask you, and I'm going to pray that we all see God in every season of life. There's 14 extremes given in this passage. That word seasons indicates that there are moments or at least times in life that we have to endure. Notice the, the phrase times and seasons, they go together. I want you to see in your notes Daniel chapter number 2. Daniel chapter number 2 verse 20 says, Daniel answered and said, Blessed be the name of God forever and ever, for wisdom and might are his. And he changeth the times and the what? Seasons. Who does it say has power to change the times and the seasons? Who alone has that ability? It is who? God. The seasons are something, as God promised, even after the flood, he told Mr. Noah, he said, no, I'm going to make you a promise. The seasons will continue as long as there's life on earth. I will make sure, God says, as a heavenly vow, that I will continue the seasons. There will not be a break. It's still going. There, are, there is something to be understood that God has control of every season. Acts chapter 1, verse 7. In fact, if you know of Acts, Acts chapter 1 is the ascension of Christ. He gives his last words to the disciples as he ascends up into heaven. And in verse number 6, the disciples asked him, is now the time that you set up your kingdom? And he responds in verse 7 by saying this. It's in your notes. Jesus said unto them, it's not for you to know the what? times or the seasons that God the Father hath put in his own power. See, the Heavenly Father has power over the times and seasons. We don't know. We don't know when the times or seasons are going to be. Time, let me give you a little bit of difference. Time is linear, right? We have a time, we have a watch. But I'm going to tell you, seasons are cyclical, meaning they come and they go. We have the same seasons over and over again. It would be kind of odd if in the middle of July we had a minus 12 degree day in northwest Indiana. Would that be a little bit odd? I know we talk about how crazy weather is in Indiana, northwest Indiana. But that would be unique, would it not? And likewise, it would probably be interesting if we had a 105 degree day in the month of January. Would that be a little weird around here? It would not go along with the seasons. 
Let me give you a couple points from our text this morning. Stick with me if you can, if you can in Ecclesiastes 3, especially if you have your Bibles. Verse 1 says, to everything there is a what? Season. Let me hear everybody, all your voices together, okay? I'm not a TV screen. I'm not a YouTube video, okay? I can see you. People don't realize that, you know? I do see people picking their noses every so often. So I can see you, all right? So respond, hey, okay, all together. To everything there is a? There you go. Thank you for your voice this morning. Number one, everything has a season. Everyone write that in your notes if you have those, if you're going to take them this morning. Number one, everything has a season. It says to everything there is a season. Notice, notice as we go through our notes, a time to be born and a time to die. A time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted, which we, we associate that with seasons, right? There's a season that you're supposed to be planting crops, and there's a season that you're supposed to be harvesting crops. Okay, that makes sense. But everything else, you have to realize there is a season. There's a time to kill, and there's a time to heal. There's a time to break down. There's a time to build up. There's a time to weep. There's a time to laugh. How many of you have ever laughed at a time you're not supposed to? Anybody ever have that? How many of you have ever cried at a time you're not supposed to, right? You know what I'm saying? I've seen some weddings, and it's supposed to be the most beautiful day of their life, and they're weeping their eyes out. It's like, no, joy, happiness. Of course, that's interesting. But, uh, and then I, I, remember girl, I remember being in church one time, and uh, we had some of the most funny things that happened. All right, my, We went to my grandparents' church. This was in central Illinois, and um, the church was entirely elderly, and we were, t- we were kids. And uh, we went there, and there was a sweet, this sweet lady, but she had to be in her upper 90s. She was up there. And she opened her purse and she said, oh, can I give you all candy? Now, we have a large family. I'm the oldest of 11 myself. So when we went there, we had a bunch of cousins and so forth. She passed out these little Hershey's kisses to everybody. Pulled them out of her purse. Right? I opened mine. Mine had that like little white colored substance on it. You know what I mean? Looked like a little bit old. And then I'm looking at, I'm looking at this thing and the tip had a little bit of a hole in it. So I'm looking at this thing, looking down and and this little white worm sticks its head out of this hole, looks around. I thought, man. Now, the pastor's up there preaching, okay? Everybody else had already eaten theirs. I forgot. And do you remember this, Jack? <laughs> my brother Jack's here. It, we, are, we are, I passed it down. My cousin's sitting next to me. and Passed it all the way down. My brother John, that wasn't you, Jack. My brother John, he was about six years old. He was sitting at the end of one of the pews. We passed it all the way down. We're... John just takes it. He thought that someone passed him some candy. Throws it in his mouth and starts chewing. Now I'll tell you, you're not supposed to laugh. The pastor was being very serious. But I am just telling you, in that moment, my mom looked at me, and I, I was trying with all my heart not to laugh. It was hard, brother and sister, I'll tell you. There, are, there is a time to laugh. Sometimes we get those out of order. There are seasons for that. You know, there are seasons that we have to go through mourning in life. Did you realize that? How many as you get older, you realize there are some seasons that come? When I, I want you to understand some of the wisdom here. Because there was this philosophy that came out called hedonism. The Greek philosopher Epicurus in the 4th century B.C., came up with this thing called hedonism. Hedonism is the philosophical concept that suggests that pleasure and happiness are the ultimate goals in life. And it prioritizes seeking pleasure and avoiding pain. That's the primary goal of human existence. Folks, that's absolutely not biblical. It's contrary to what God has instituted And what we're going to see today is some very important aspect of our life. It's called the seasons of life. Everything has a season. Many Christians are stuck in that worldly concept, that humanistic thinking, that my goals this year are to have a good year, to have a fun year, to avoid the bad and only have the good. I want you to tell, I'm going to tell you today, That is wrong thinking, and it's why many of our years are terrible. It's why many of our lives, we are very disappointed with with things year after year after year after year. 
It's why we say 2024 will be a better year. You know, every time it's before New Year's, everybody's like, 2024 will be better. It'll have better things. It'll be up and up. And it's probably because we have a wrong mindset. I want to help you with that mindset today. There are some seasons because everything has one. Letter A, I want you to notice there are seasons of provision. And I'm going to come biblically here today because the Bible says the eyes of, the, of, of all that wait upon thee. Now, this is a prayer to God in the book of Psalms. The eyes of all wait upon thee, God, and thou givest them their meat in due season. If you're like me, there are times that I get hungry. Yes? And I go to my fridge, and I open my fridge. Praise God for fridge refrigerators. Amen? I open my fridge in my house. And I open all the drawers, and I go through all the shelves, and I don't find anything to eat. And I open the freezer, and the freezer, my freezer is packed full. Like, if you have to fit, like, an ice cream bar in there, you probably won't find space, okay? And I look through my whole freezer, and there's nothing to eat. And I open my, we have a, we have a pantry, and, a cu- and cupboards, and I open all my shelves, and there's cans and boxes, Have you ever come away with looking at all that food and say to yourself, there's nothing to eat in the whole house? Have you ever told yourself that? Because that's what I do. I'll go, there's nothing to eat. Now, maybe I have to make stuff, but that's not what I do, okay? I can't do that stuff. If it has the word pop on it, like pop tart, popcorn, I I can use a microwave. But other than that, we probably in our house have more food than we're going to eat. I'll even tell you this. There's probably a lot of food we throw away that gets spoiled. We plan it. We're going we're gonna to eat this, put it in a Tupperware thing, and it gets put in the back of the fridge. It's still there. Isn't it amazing? There's like how many? Seven? How many, uh, how many billion people are on the planet? Is it seven billion people? Eight billion? I don't know the number. I haven't counted lately, but if, if we went to the number of how many people, you know, God had put, has put enough provision on earth to feed all of us today. One of the prayers in the Lord's, Supper, the Lord's Prayer, I'm sorry, is give us this day our daily bread. We do take that for granted far too much, do we? Don't we? God put enough food yesterday to feed the entire planet. He will again tomorrow. Now, there are seasons the Lord blesses and gives provision the Bible says that God gives food in due season. Letter B, I want you to notice there's seasons of blessing. Boy, I'm thankful for seasons of blessing. You ever received a blessing from the Lord and God gave it to you in such a way, he stamped it in such a way that you knew it was from him and him alone? This was not of any person's doing. This wasn't just good fortune. This was God giving you a blessing personally. You ever had one of those? By the way, if you don't, then you're not in tune with God because he does it all the time. You know, God gave you enough air to breathe today. You know why? Because he loved you. If you didn't realize it, then you didn't realize the blessing of God. God gave you a sunrise this morning. God gave you a season. God, gave, God gives you so much. And we just simply don't take it as blessing. But there are seasons of blessing. There are sometimes blessings do come. The Bible says, And he shall be like a tree planted by the rivers of water that bringeth forth his fruit in his season. His leaf also shall not wither, and whatsoever he doeth, shall prosper. There are seasons of blessing. There are, there, are, there are seasons of temptation, the Bible says. It says in Luke chapter 4, verse 13, and when he, the devil had ended all the temptation, next screen, temptation, Kyler. When the devil had ended all the temptation, he departed from him for a, what does it say in your notes? Season. Did you know Satan was tempting Christ in this passage? And the Bible says he had seasons of temptation. There are seasons of temptations in our lives. I just want to remind you, you may think you have beaten a sin in your life. It'll come back. Parents know this very, very well. You know, you think, I I have five children, and it's kind of like the guy spinning all those those plates, trying to keep them spinning there. You think one kid's doing well, guess what will happen in just a little bit of time? They're going to get into trouble. And that's part of it. We all have seasons of temptation. You know, I don't know where you're at today. You might be right in the middle of a a temptation of Satan in your life. There's some seasons that come. Notice the next season, letter D, if you have your notes there, there's a season of suffering. Did you know that suffering is not only God allowed, many of them are God ordained. 
We don't like to think of it that way, do we? Suffering has a season. Look at 1 Peter chapter 1, verse 6. Now, this is radical thinking, but this is Christian thinking. You ready? Wherein ye greatly rejoice, though now for a season, if need be, ye are in heaviness through manifold temptations, that the trial of your faith, being much more precious than of gold that perisheth, though it be tried with fire, might be found unto the praise and honor and glory at the appearing of Jesus Christ. There are seasons, folks, we are going to go through that are seasons of suffering. They're, they're letter E, seasons of reaping. There's a law God has put into this universe. It's called the law of sowing and reaping. That whatsoever a man soweth, that shall he also reap. <laughs> we don't like to have to reap always what we sow. You know, you're reaping today what you sowed in previous days, months, and years. And too many people are just mad at God because God is having us reap what we sowed. In reality, much of what we are going through today is because we put it in the ground. Um, John R. Rice used to say many, many Christians, they sow their wild oats and then they pray to God that there won't be a harvest. You have to be careful what we sow. Be careful what thoughts you're planting in your heart each and every day. Because it will come out. It will manifest itself. It will grow. If you want to reap later on, start planting the things that, you're, that you want to reap now. And it does take a little bit of time, but the Bible says, as we read in our call to worship, and let us not be weary in well-doing, for in due season we shall reap if we faint not. Can you imagine a farmer that had a whole bunch of land that decided, I'm not going to go plant this year? What do you think he's going to get in harvest time? Weeds? Pastor, my life is so barren right now. Well, okay, maybe it's because during a season you should have been planting, you weren't. And now, what is that lesson that's teaching us, right? What should we be doing now then? Maybe it's a season. But I want you to understand that there's seasons of life. Number one, everything has a season. Let's say that. Everything has a whether it be a season of provision, blessing, temptation, suffering, reaping, they are all important and they're all necessary. Number two, I want you to notice this truth tonight. Tonight. Boy, I haven't been preaching that long, have I? It's 11 o'clock. Notice this truth this morning. You ready? Every season has a time. Let's say that together. Every season has a time. The Bible says to everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under the heaven. There is a particular time that fall is supposed to show up, right? I'm looking forward to that. There is a particular time that it's supposed to snow, like for Christmas only, right? Amen? In our minds. There is a particular time for every season. So ev everything has a season, but there is a designated God-ordained time for that season. I want you to catch this because our God is always on time. Are you with me this morning? Our God is always on time. He's never late and he's never early. His timing is perfect. Yours is not. See, we don't see all things. If you go to verse number 11, let's all read verse 11. If you still have your notes there, if you have your Bible open. He, speaking of God, hath made everything beautiful. What's the next three words? In his, what? Time. Now that's interesting. Let's go through this again and let's understand it in that context. He hath made everything, what? Beautiful in his time. God hath made everything beautiful in the right time. Now let's go back and look at some of these things. Because remember, there's 14 extremes given in these verses. Number one, a time to be born. How many say that's, that's beautiful? Did you know a time to die is also beautiful? In his time. See, now we look at one half of these coins and we say one thing's good and one thing's bad. No, 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 friend. Don't miss the truth. They're both beautiful in the right time. Yes? Look at the next one. A time to plant, a time to pluck up that which is planted. Is one good, is one bad? By the way, look at the next one. A time to kill and a time to heal. Now, how many of you would naturally look at some of these verses and go, one is good 
but one is bad. Naturally, that's how I look at it, right? Are you all with me? Because we would say a time to kill, that's wrong. That's bad. A time to heal. Pastor, when is the context of when it's time to kill? Well, first and foremost, I believe in something called capital punishment. How many know what capital punishment is? It's amazing that there are people today so messed up by worldly, and I'm going to just say it this way, antichrist thinking, that they believe it's right to kill a child in the womb, but it's wrong to kill a murderer on death row. <whistles> Upside down. There is a time to kill. The Bible says if you kill a man, you should also be killed. Likewise, be killed. There are times to kill. Now, I would say that's not good, but you know what? If we don't do it, what when God says it, is it bad? Yes, it is. If we do not listen to God. Look at what just watch this. You ready? A time to weep and a time to laugh. Now, how many of you think that laughing is good, weeping is bad? That's a man thing to think, isn't it? I used to tell my wife, my, you know, I, I had five sisters growing up, and sometimes they would just cry. And I asked my one sister one time, why are you crying? I don't know. Sometimes I just have to cry. Now, to me, I go, that's crazy. My wife said, sometimes you don't understand. Crying just heals you. I said, that's, that's crazy. I don't get it. Because I, I grew up, my dad's a real big sports guy, and he always, you know, crying doesn't fix anything. You're right, it doesn't. So I don't think crying fixes anything. But the Bible says there's a time to weep, doesn't it? There's a time to laugh, isn't there? Look at this. There's a time to mourn, and there's a time to dance. And God hath made everything beautiful in his what? Time. There's a time to cast away stones. There's a time to gather stones together. There's a, by the way, how many of you realize this? There's a time to work, and there's time to play. You ever have to teach your kids this one? There's a time to work. There's a time to play. You know, adults, I'm here to tell you, much of our lives are messed up because we are trying to do things out of order. We're trying to have a season that it's not the time for that season. Uh, let me just speak to our younger folks here today. Maybe we're all young at heart, right? If you're especially a young man, if you're a young man in here, it's time to work. Our society has gotten so filled with people that are, well, boys who don't want to become men. My dad used to say, son, men work hard. And there's some 35-year-old, 45-year-old boys who haven't learned the lesson of life. It's time to work. And then they come and they say, hey, I missed a whole season. What do I do? Well, now we can start it, but you're way behind the game. Amen. I need some amens this morning from some men. There is a season to work. Are you with me? The Bible says it is good. In fact, in Ecclesiastes, it is good that a man bear the yoke in his youth. You know why God gave young people energy? To work. There is a time to work. And if you push that off out of the wrong season, you're going to realize you got your seasons messed up. There is a time for every season. Hey, listen to me. There is a time to work. There's a time. Look at this. A time to embrace. Look at verse 5. A time to embrace. Now, embrace has more. It's not necessarily just hugging. Okay? It's more like there's a time to have intimacy. How many of you would agree that that's what marriage is for biblically? Amen. There is a time to embrace. There is a time to refrain from embracing. Biblically, if you are not married, you should not be having sex with someone. That's called fornication, folks. And if you get things out of order, then you're not understanding the season of life that you're in. There's a time to embrace. There's a time to refrain from embracing. They stopped teaching this in school long ago. Abstinence. No one should be having sex out of marriage. If you're married, you have sex. If you're not married, you don't have sex. Can I get an amen today? Amen. Pastor, that's really, really, really old-fashioned. Yeah, and it fixed almost a lot of our societal problems today. Amen. Of course, well, you can't really teach that today. You can if you have God in your heart. See, we get things out of order, and we get our seasons screwed up, and we want a season that God has for us now. And we want to push a season God has for us now to another time. And I want you to realize, folks, 
Every season has a particular time. Okay? Now, I'm not doing this to boast in any way, but one of the wonderful blessings I have in my marriage is when my wife and I walked down a wedding aisle, we were both virgins. Folks, that is the great, one of the greatest blessings of my life. I'm not saying this because if you say, well, Pastor, that's not me. How can I go back to that? Well, you start from where you're at, and God can fix and, and heal, but you've got to realize there is a season for every time. You get, you get me? Look at this, letter, uh, letter A. There's beauty of seasons. The Bible says, God has made everything, what? Beautiful in its time. If you have the right season at the right time, God calls it what? Beautiful. If you have a beautiful season in the wrong time, it's not beautiful. It's out of order. Seasons aren't good or bad. They're beautiful if they're in the right time. Look at what God said in Genesis 131 when he created everything. He saw everything he had made, and behold, it was very good. Trying to avoid the season that you are in is actually making a mess of the beautiful story God is writing. I want you to realize this, folks. Are you there in verse number 11? God says, God hath made everything beautiful in his time, and he, God, hath set the world in the, in the heart, in the heart of man, so that no man can find out the work that God maketh from the beginning to the end. Nobody can see the volume and the novel that God is writing through your life. No one can see it. I can't see what God's doing in my life. I can't see the beauty of it. But God is writing your story. And you cannot, or in fact, you will make a mess of the beautiful story God's writing in you and through you if you try to avoid the seasons that, you're, that God wants you to be in. Look at what it says in James chapter 1, verse number 2. It says, My brethren, count it all joy when you fall into divers or many temptations, many trials. Have you ever had not just one trial, but they come in like threes, they say, right? When it rains, it pours. You don't have just one problem. You get a pile of problems. What a great week that is, isn't it? What a great month those make. But the Bible says this. Notice, brethren, count it all joy when you fall into many trials. Knowing this, that the trying of your faith worketh patience. But let patience have her perfect work, that she may be perfect and entire, wanting or lacking nothing. God has to write this chapter in your book. So understand the beauty of the season that you're in. I get, I, I, get, I get messages sometimes that are like, Pastor, we got bad news. And I agree, there's some things that I would say, but that's just, that is terrible news. But we have to understand this in light of God. We live in a world that God exists, amen? amen. He has allowed this season. He has ordained this season. Are you guys with me here? See, this is what, this is what biblically thinking is. This is what having a mindfulness of God is all about. God is in charge of the seasons. He has a purpose for the seasons. You can call it bad, you can call it good, but in God's time, everything is beautiful. Notice letter B, the order of the seasons. I want you to see the beauty of the seasons, but the order of the seasons. And, and underline that, word, those, that phrase in your verse, in his time. When seasons are out of order, things always die. You ever have frost come when, you got, when you're trying to grow some stuff? They'll have a frost warning. Careful, go cover your petunias. I don't even know if petunias die in the frost. I don't, probably not. I'm not a gardener, so hey. When seasons get out of order, things die. Friend, listen to me very carefully. You are going to kill some special things in your life if you get your seasons out of order. If you demand to have something that should be for later, and you demand to have it now. And if there's something that you're putting off that you're supposed to be doing now, you're pushing it off to a later season, you're going to realize that you're killing your growing season in his time. The last portion, we get to Ecclesiastes 7, verse 29. Lo, I have, this I have found, that God hath made man upright, but they have sought out many inventions. In his time, not our time. By the way, it's only beautiful in his time, not our time. Let's say that together. It's only beautiful in his time, not our time. You can't write your story. 
He is. You can't see the end. He can. That's why the Bible says in Proverbs 3, 5, and 6, Trust in the Lord with all thine heart, and lean not to thine own understanding. In all thy ways acknowledge him, and he shall direct thy paths. He has an order for your seasons. Accept it. If I had everybody take out a 3x5 card, if I passed them out and I said, write down some issues you're going through right now, we'd get a, we'd get a, we'd get a lot of them in the, in the room here this morning. We, we'd have a lot of different needs, a lot of different seasons. What season are you in? I want you to realize this morning, number one, everything has a season, and number two, every season has a time. Last point, and this is where it all comes together. I want you to really get this last one. You ready? Every time has a purpose. Every time has a purpose. Let's say that together. Every time has a purpose. To everything there is a season and a time to every purpose under heaven. I can't see how God can use this for good. And that would be a true statement. That would be, you are basically describing verse number 11. No man findeth out the work that God maketh from beginning to end. Nobody can see the purpose that God has for your season right now except for God. Let me quote you Romans chapter 8 verse 28. And we know that all things work together for good to them that love God to them who are the called, according to his purpose. Friend, every time has a purpose. Every time has a purpose. I want you to do three things with me today. In whatever season you're in, whatever stage of life you're in, wherever you're at, number one, I want you to evaluate your seasons. Evaluate your seasons. What season am I in, Lord? Are there any specific seasons that I'm trying to avoid? Is there any season, is there any step in my life I should have taken like seasons ago, but I'm still hesitant to take it? Are there still things, Lord, that you, I know you've been pressing on me for a while, but I'm still avoiding it. I want you to evaluate your seasons. Do you know why God wants you to take that step? I'm going to get real with you in a second. You ready? I had a, my daughter, Megan, she's sitting right here. She turned 13 yesterday. And my other daughter, Noelle, 14. She'll be 15 this year. How many remember way back when you were a teenager? Anybody remember that? All right. Did you ever, for even a moment, maybe even for a, a week or a month, maybe even for a whole decade, Think that your parents' rules were there to make you miserable? Do you ever think that way? Do you ever have that thought come in your head? I know why they're doing this. Because they want me to be miserable. I know why the school has a handbook. So that we have no fun here, right? Did, they, did you ever talk that way? Genius talking. Genius at work here. Do you ever realize... God may be having you in a season for your benefit. Maybe because he loves you. Hmm. See, we're just as dumb as some of the teenagers that say, my parents just don't want us to have any fun, or they want your life to be the most fun. Amen? They know that in one day you can ruin your entire life. So does God. I want you to evaluate your seasons and realize that no matter at what age, we can buy into the devil's lie that God has a... Wants me to do something, and if I do it, I'll be miserable. God has something he said. I just want to have fun, and I can't give this up for God. If you don't give it up for God, only you will find misery. I'm just here to tell you. Friend, we have folks that are trying to live their life and their sinful pleasures and also find God's will. And folks, you got to let go of the one to find the other. This is how it works. Evaluate your seasons. What season are you not accepting? What lesson should you learn in this season? These are great things to pray with between you and your God. God, this is what I'm in. What are you teaching me here? 
What do you want from me here? Lord, what is it that you want? Have you ever asked God that in the midst of your season? Maybe your season is delaying because you haven't asked that or learned the lesson yet. But there may be an answer to your season when you submit to God and say, Lord, I realize that there is a season of this. Folks, there's a season of it. Evaluate your season. What steps need to be taken in this season? You realize what Job says. You guys remember the book of Job? Now, I'm not telling you that all of us should use Job as an example for our lives because that seems to be kind of like the cliche thing. I feel like Job, pastor. Have you read the book of Job? What happened to him? That's insane. Job is the extreme situation in human history of someone who lost everything in one day. I feel like Job, pastor. Look what Job said. His wife said, why don't you just curse God and die? That's your next step. There's no purpose of anything left. Look what Job says. He says in Job chapter 2.10, but he said unto her, thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. By the way, don't quote that verse to your wife. Then just trust me on that one. That does not end well. But Job did it, so hey. Thou speakest as one of the foolish women speaketh. What? Shall we receive good at the hand of God, and shall we not receive the evil? In all this did, Job, did not Job sin with his lips. God may bring a season of suffering. Understand God can use that. I, I, sometimes we get bad health news. I, 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 you know, I wish we all had good health all the time. But you know what? There are seasons of good health and there are seasons of, what's the word? Bad health. I mean, did you expect to live your whole life and die healthy? I'm serious about this. I think sometimes we have, we have false expectations in life, do we not? And we get mad at the doctors because, you know, we're 86 and we have joint pain. Why can't they figure it out? Well, because they're not God. Pastor, how come I have this particular unique health problem? First of all, health problems are not unique. Aging is not unique. Sickness is not unique. Now, you might have some more than others in some areas, but I want you to understand this. You cannot accept some seasons and reject others. And some of us need to change our mindset instead of saying, God, you have to do something because this is not good. Maybe God says this is good. You need to accept it. Did you know Paul had this same problem? He went to God three times. The Bible says he sought the Lord three times. He had a particularly unique health problem, the Apostle Paul. The Bible, he, he called it a thorn in the flesh. He called it a messenger of Satan to buffet me. But you know what God, you know what God said to, to Paul? My grace is sufficient for thee. God didn't heal Paul of his physical problem. God put it there for a purpose. Paul acknowledged this. You say, Pastor, I don't understand this health problem that I have come my way. Understand that God put it there for a purpose. People get mad at God all the time. God, how come you took... I just had a conversation a couple months ago. A young lady was extremely mad that God took her great-grandmother at the age of 102. Were you expecting... How long were you expecting? I expected more time. Whether you die at 52 or 102... In a, hundred, in a thousand years from now, we'll all be in eternity, folks. It won't matter how much time you had. What will matter is, what did you do with the time God gave you? Evaluate your seasons. Evaluate your life. This is part of the understanding that is great wisdom. I understand this is a very deep message this morning. But I want you to understand, shall we receive good at the hand of the Lord and not receive the evil? By the way, what we call good and what we call evil. Some people get mad at God for the simple realization that he is God and you are not. He gets to call the shots, you do not. You can get mad at that all you want. You can get upset at him all you want. But he's the one that made you. He knows your beginning and he knows your what? He knows it. He knows every path that you can take. He has a purpose for your life. Evaluate your seasons. Let her be embrace your seasons. Embrace it. 
embrace it. Every season has a divine purpose. Did you hear me on this one? Every season has a divine purpose. God has a purpose for what you're going through. God has a purpose for what you're going through. Listen to me. Listen to me. Hey. All right, my kids are about to get out of school in exactly nine days. (whistles) Praise God for nine days. And they're like, whoa, I can't wait to get out of school. I said, well, what are you going to do in the summer? Well, I don't know. Now, our, my kids whine about going to school, but how many of you think school at least has a purpose? You know, a lot of us spiritually, we whine about something, and without that, we'd really lose purpose in life. God has some purposes for us. Embrace your purpose. Go to God and say, let me quote your Bible verse. You ready? First Thessalonians 5.18, in everything give thanks, for this is the will of God in Christ Jesus concerning you. By the way, you know what our main purpose in any season is? It's our theme for the year. It's that I may know him. God's main purpose for the season you're going is so that you get to know him better. It's the whole purpose of life. It's the whole purpose of life. The purpose of life is not to follow your heart. You'll find that's a dead-end road every single time. The purpose of life is to know your God. That I may know him and the power of his resurrection and the fellowship of his sufferings, that I may made, be made conformable unto his death. Folks, know him. And lastly, let her see, enjoy your seasons. Enjoy your seasons. Let me describe life in a, in a quick nutshell. Let me walk you through it real quick. You ready? My son, four years, at four years old, all his four older sisters, by the way, pray for my son. He's seven. He's going to pretty soon have four teenage sisters, Okay. At four years old, he cried. Every, my wife will tell you, every single day, his dad and his sisters went to school. He was four. <laughs> Please, can I go to school today? And his, older, his oldest sister would always look at him and go, What? Are you crazy? Are you crazy? She even asked, Can I switch places? Can he go to school and I stay home? He was, he was in tears. You know why? He couldn't go to school. You know what? He went to kindergarten. He liked kindergarten, but he found out that the, when he got out of kindergarten, the grade schoolers got extended recess, and here's the kicker, they didn't have to take a nap. So he was no longer content being in kindergarten. Guess what he wanted to do? I can't wait. He kept saying, I can't, Dad, I can't wait till I'm in first grade. He said this the first month of kindergarten. I said, well, son, you, you, you got to learn some things in kindergarten. Yeah, but they don't have to take naps, Dad. And he cried every time that they made him take a nap. Which, by the way, how many of you think that sounds sweeter the older you get? If your work made you take a nap, you would, I mean, a tear would be in your eye for a different reason. But anyway, he got there, all right? He's in grade school, all right? He's in grade school. And the oldest kids in our grade school, in our Christian school, were the sixth graders. You know what happens? All the grade schoolers look up to the sixth graders. I mean, like, literally. And figured it. They go, man, I can't wait till I'm in sixth grade. They're the oldest ones in all the grade school. They rule the roost. They walk around like they're, like, king of the place, you know? Then they go to junior high. Junior hires think they know it all. I taught for many years. And I always say, if we took a picture of you, you're going to be embarrassed very shortly at how you look. Nope, I'm the coolest. Anyway. (laughs) But junior hires, they're not content being junior hires. They want to get to high school. That's the big school. Well, freshmen, you're not content until you're a senior, right? And the seniors aren't content until they're, I can't wait till I'm graduated. I just thought we did a senior trip uh, with with, with our seniors, and my wife and I were a part of it. And yeah, they're, oh, we got nine more days. They're counted out. And I'm thinking in my own head, and then real life begins. How many of you wish you could go back to living some of that of those days, you know? The simplicity of that. Well, then those high schoolers, they're not content. They're graduated. Now they're not content. Now they've got to go to college. Or they're not content because they're single. Or they're not content because, you know, they don't have kids yet. How many of you realize there isn't a season of life that if I asked and polled everybody that they're 100% content? You won't find it. In fact, I dare say you wouldn't even find half. I'm content where I'm at. Here's the problem with our seasons. 
There's good in every season. Say that with me. God made, hath made everything beautiful in his time. Some of you are miserable, not because of your season, but because of your outlook. You're not understanding that God hath made this season for you. You say, Pastor, I can't accept this season. And that's why you're going to get stuck in it. You've got to learn a lesson there. See, if my kids never learned the lesson in junior high, they never graduate to high school. Neither should they, correct? In whatever stage you're at in life, say, Lord, what are you trying to teach me? And God goes, I thought you'd never ask. Your seasons extend when you don't come to God to find the reason for your season. Folks, enjoy your season. Life's not about the destination. It's about the journey. Enjoy the season you're in. I can remember we had some young kids. We were having really young kids back in the time when we had four, all of our girls, and they were all very young at the time. We used to have like three car seats, and the one that was not in the car seat should have been, right? We're going to the store, and the, they're crying, and they're, I can remember there was an older lady that came up, and she goes, you guys look like you're having so much fun. And I looked at her like, then you take them. <laughs> and she, she knew my thoughts because she said, you're having a time of your life, but you never realize it. I thought about that. See, folks, you're in the prime of your life if you accept what season you're in. God has a season for you. Would you stop fighting his seasons? Some of us need to come to an altar today or at least come to the prayer to the closet today and say, Lord, I accept what, what you, what you, where you have me. I accept what you're doing. I'm going to be yielded to you. Folks, that's all he wants to hear. And what God can do with a yielded servant, this is when you understand seasons of life. Look at what he says in this verse in Philippians 4. It's in your notes. Paul's writing from the Mamertine prison. He said, not that I speak in respect of want, for I have learned in so whatsoever state I am, season I am, therewith to be content. I know how to be abased. I know how to abound. Everywhere and in all things I am instructed both to be full and to be hungry, both to abound and to suffer need. I can do all things through Christ, which strengtheneth me. If you're ever asking the question, where's God in all this? Where's God in all this? Good verse. He's on a shirt. Maybe I've, you say, I've wasted a lot of, by the way, I, I can tell you this. I've wasted a lot of days in my life not understanding the season. Let me close with this story. The missionary Adoniram Judson, who was a missionary to the country of Myanmar, in fact, when he got on the boat to go to Myanmar, he was not a Baptist. He met a Baptist on the uh, six-week boat ride over, and as he studied scripture, he became a Baptist. And he wrote back to his denomination that sent him, and he said, on his arrival, he said, uh, I cannot continue under this denomination. I'm going to have to cancel your support. And so he did. He had no support over there. Things went well for a while for Adoniram Judson. He worked there for many decades, and many people were saved, and people coming to Christ in the country of Myanmar. But then almost immediately, his season changed. The government came down upon him. They imprisoned him. He endured a period where he had daily beatings, and they tortured him for an extended period of time. Finally, they let his wife come see him. She had not seen him, seen him in eight months. His wife came into this dark prison, no light in it. He was hanging from the prison ceiling by his thumbs, his whole weight. When she saw him malnourished, he wasn't even conscious. She began weeping. She tried to get him awake, and he did for a period. She took out a letter from her pocket, and she said, the supporting churches haven't heard from us in a bit. They need to hear an update what's going on. He told her this phrase. He said, write this down. Send this back to them. He said, the future is as bright as the promises of God. He told his wife, just write that and send it, to, send it to all my churches. The future is as bright as the promises of God. 
His wife shortly thereafter died. He continued there. He died having seen many people come to Christ as, his, as their Savior. The, the, the evangelist Scott Pauley, I was listening to a message of his not too long ago, and he said he stopped at a major university, Alabama University. This was just, just happened a year and a half ago. The University of Alabama, roll tide. He uh, stopped there, and uh, he was in a university ministry, and he found that there was a group that was meeting there, about four dozen students, and uh, they had revival services. They studied the Bible, and they asked him to come meet with them. He had not heard of them, but they had heard of his podcast. And he, he went, and he went and studied Bible with them, and he, he said, he, by the end of their study, he said, now, how did you guys start this Bible study? And they said, well, there's a guy nobody's ever heard of. His name's Adoniram Judson. Well, if, you're, if you went to Baptist Seminary College, you learned about Adoniram Judson. He said, I know that. I've, heard of, I've read several of his, of his books. I've read his biography. He said, well, there's this guy, Adoniram Judson. He was a missionary to Myanmar. And he said one of his converts, in fact, his close disciples, were one of, his, uh, one of, our, one of the students that came here. His great, great, great grandparents were led to God and discipled in Myanmar. And they had church and church church. He came over here to become a doctor, and he started studying at the University of Alabama. He said when he came over here, he thought that America would be teaching and preaching the word of God. He said he found at Alabama University, University of Alabama, nobody was on campus preaching this book. He said, and God changed his heart his freshman year, and he decided to become a preacher. He said, no one was preaching God's word, so he said, I guess that's my job. He said, so this, 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 this one student started a Bible study program, and since then, over 400 students have come to Christ at the University of Alabama. And Scott Pauley writes this, and he says, we're, we're talking about 150 years after the death of Adoniram Judson, there are people still that are being saved because of his testimony. And he wrote that phrase. Listen to this phrase. The future is as bright as the promises of God. Friend, let me just tell you this. You can get your mind so wrapped up on the problems that you're going through that you don't see the God behind the problems, over the problems, through the problems. See, we pray, God, take the problem away. God may say, no, but I'll walk right beside you as we go through it. Yea, though I walk through the valley of the shadow of death, I will fear no evil, for thou art with me. Folks, get to know God through your seasons. I don't know how this could have helped, but I know that there are a lot of seasons that are upon us today. A lot of hurting hearts, and Lord, Lord knows that we all need to go through some seasons. Heavenly Father, we come to this passage of Scripture. And as we are going to study this through the month of May, our different seasons in life, help us to have an understanding. Maybe just an understanding that it's not time for us to avoid our seasons. Help us to embrace them. Help us to find you in them. Maybe there's somebody here whose heart has been far from you, Lord. Maybe it's time, Lord, they come to you. Maybe you're using the seasons of life to try to get them to come to you. You've used blessing at times, Lord, to get us to repent. Sometimes you have to bring hardships to cause us to repent. Help us to accept your seasons to find everything beautiful in your time. Maybe there's someone in the room that's got their seasons out of order. They're refusing to follow through in one season, and they're demanding to have another. Lord, I pray that we would just accept your season. Help us to trust you through it. That's the only way to get through this life. Lord, that's the only way to find the joy and the peace is the Lord trust in you. With every head bowed and eye closed, you'd say, Pastor Ben, I want to have this a private moment between you and God. No one looking around, for I don't want to embarrass anyone, but you say, Pastor Ben, I'm going through a tough season, and I need to hear God. I need to hear from God. I want to, hear, I want to know God, and whatever it is that he wants from me, I will embrace the season. Would that be you if you'd slip your hand up? You don't have to, you don't have to raise your hand for me. Raise your hand because that's something the Lord's working on you Maybe there's something that you're putting off. Maybe there's a season God has, and you know that's the step you need to take. And you say, Lord, help me to embrace the season that I know I need to embrace. Something that you're putting off or something that you're putting out of order. You say, Pastor Ben, I've been, I've been getting my seasons out of order. 
Help me to get it right, Lord. But if that's you, would you slip your hand up? Well, I see hand here and there, here and there. A couple over here. Lord and Heavenly Father, we are just simply yours. And the sooner we understand that, the more clearly we understand life. You're the author of seasons. You bring them, you bring them to a close. Help us to trust you, Lord. We can't see the beginning and the end. Lord, you can. Help us to trust in you with all our heart. If there's someone in here who hasn't trusted you as their Savior, they haven't called upon you for salvation, Lord, today is that day that they need to do so. Maybe there's the step of baptism someone needs to take after salvation. Lord, maybe there's a step of joining in a church and getting involved and serving and trying to help others, trying to find some people to help in life. I pray, Lord, whatever it is, may you do your work. With every head bowed and eye closed, would you stand to your feet? At this time, I'd ask that our organ begin to play. If you want to make a decision, we have an altar that's open. You can come and pray. Even in your seat, you may do so. But let's all stand to our feet. Let's make sure that we make a decision for the Lord.